All right, no worries. Okay, one, two, three. All right, today we have is, we are gonna jump straight in because you have an amazing journey and I wanna find out all about it. Can you please tell us um, the start of your journey with pelvic health for you? Yeah, of course. So it started um, pretty much a few years after I started getting my period and I just remember having this intense pain every time I'd get my period and I'd have this horrific back pain that would just come a few a few days before my period and I just sort of used to be like okay that back pain's coming my period will be here in a few days and so that was 2008 so I think I was about like 14 um, when that all sort of started and I just put up with that and I'd have incredibly heavy periods and need to sleep on a towel and things like that um yeah so that was quite a tricky time and obviously mum knew about that and she experienced the same thing and she was like yes like I used to have to sleep on a towel as well like this is this is how uh we are dealing with it that's what we've got in our family um and then yeah it was so two or so years of that and then it just progressively started to get worse and um, mum being a nurse was like oh this is getting worse like I think you know we should look into this further so I went to the GP for the first time and um, I was offered the contraceptive pill because you know you can stop having your periods altogether and you only need to have a period every three months and that sounded like a dream for me at that time because you were 16 then yeah so I was 16 and um you know it was like okay well I can't (laughs) yeah I can't deal with this pain anymore I'm sick of bleeding through my school skirt um Yeah, just horrific. And so mum was even thinking then like, oh, is this endometriosis? Because like with the nursing background, she Mm -hmm. had heard of it previously. Um, But the doctor was like, no, no, it's not. Um, Some girls just have heavy periods. So yeah, the pill can be a great option for this. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, anything to stop (laughs) um, bleeding through school uniforms because I had a delightful teal school skirt um, and had to do the lower bag. (laughs) trick jump to cover the your back or tie the jumper yeah so that and so for a few years that actually was like really helpful and being on the um pill. yeah being on the pill yeah. that was really good however then it all you know the wheels started to come off and only about two or so years later I was having breakthrough bleeding all the time um feeling really nauseous and really unwell Um, when I was having these bleeds like I was feeling so sick I was gonna pass out it was just a horrific time so I went back to the GP again and just said look this isn't great and I was about um, you know 17 18 then and so I was referred to a gynae um, finally so that was was good Four years. Yeah, Four from years yeah, 2008 to about 2012, 2013, before I could actually see a specialist about what was going on. Um, that specialist I did see said, look, you could have endo, but I don't actually do surgery. So I'm going to send you on to another gynae. So oh then I needed to wait um, about six months to get in with another gynae. And I saw them um, and he was like, yeah, it does sound like you've got endo let's do a laparoscopy. Um, So I had the laparoscopy in 2014. um, And going into that, um, there's all these fears and worries that, you know, you might not find anything or anything like that. Um, And that was actually the case for me. Um, I came out of surgery and the doctor said, yeah, you don't have endometriosis. You've got pelvic inflammatory disease which is caused um, by an STI. Have you um, got any sexual partners? Has your boyfriend been cheating on you? Oh, my God. Anything like this. And this was just after surgery. So um, I had my mum in front of me as well, which just made everything a lot more awkward. And I was just horrified um, because I was only 19. Yes. And, you know, so he just said, look, this is what it is. Um, Here's some antibiotics you might not be able to have children because pelvic inflammatory disease can be 
um, you know, it can cause infertility. So come back and see me when you're ready to do IVF. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So I was very upset, um, had no answers. I took the antibiotics and yet my pain was still there, still having those symptoms. And I was like, okay, well, something's just not right here. And you get that like gut feeling. And I just remember looking on like Facebook groups and things like that. And all these other people being diagnosed with endometriosis who had like the same symptoms as what I did. And I thought, honestly, surely like this is what it is. So Mm -hmm. I went back to my GP again after um, scouring through Facebook groups (laughs) and (laughs) asking for recommendations on who to actually see, who knows what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I did that and I finally got referred to an endometriosis specialist and Mm -hmm. I had my second lap in 2015 and that's when I was diagnosed with endometriosis so I did have endo all along Um, the other specialist had no idea what they were looking for and dismissed it and then not only was I diagnosed with endometriosis but I was also diagnosed with adenomyosis so it's kind of like the nasty cousin of endo so that's a condition where um the endometrium so that lining of your uterus is actually growing into the muscle wall of your uterus so it's incredibly painful um and it can make your uterus appear really bulky um so it's yeah it can often be described as being more painful than endo so I had both Both. lucky me yes I had both so yeah, so um, I was glad that I actually did follow my intuition and that I did keep advocating for myself and that something did actually end up to be wrong. Um, yeah, that it wasn't. So, yeah, so that was sort of like my journey, for lack of a word, with pelvic health um, to get my diagnosis. That's huge, Izzy. Oh, my gosh, because they not only were you dismissed but then you had to live and suffer that for so long and I love that you say that you know you've you you followed your gut instinct but you you were doing all the right things it was the people that were charged to care for you that were not helping you that's so disappointing for you I I don't even know how to begin to process that you know from one person saying oh it's because you were having unprotected sex or something to Mm. oh my gosh you've got endo plus it's really nasty ass cousin and this is the reason why you've been feeling like that I can't imagine how you felt during that time like do you remember that yeah is it relief after my first surgery I felt really angry because it was inconclusive and then I had all of these doubts about like if something actually was going on and if I did have pelvic inflammatory disease. So I felt really angry and let down and I felt really bad because my parents had paid for this surgery because I was 19 and had hardly any money. I was studying full time Mm -hmm. and I was like, I've just wasted $3,000 of their money. Um, And then, yeah. (laughs) And so then the second time around, I was even more fearful that nothing would be found again and that I was going to waste $5,000 $5,000 of their money this time and for nothing to be found yet again. But then when um, the surgeon said postoperatively, like, yes, you do have endo and you've actually also got adenomyosis, which was the first time I'd even heard of that. Um, it was such a bittersweet feeling. Like it was so much relief that like, yes, there actually was something wrong yeah. that I hadn't wasted my parents' money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, um, you know, I can actually move forward and try to start managing those symptoms and having better quality of life. Because before then, I would be so unwell that I'd just have to like lay in bed some days. I'd be skipping uni. Um, I'd have to call in sick for work, like all of those things. So it was sort of just like relief that I could try and get my life back on track. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, um, like, did you and your family, I mean, you said your mom was a nurse, so I can only imagine the conversations would have been quite open, but I don't know. I'll let you answer that. When you were younger, starting from like that 14 age, Did you talk about pelvic health very much? Oh, it's always such that awkward phase because you're going (laughs) through puberty, you're uncomfortable with your body and, you know, you kind of turn 
12, 13, 14, and you like all of a sudden hate your parents because you're like, oh, go away. You're super (laughs) annoying. Yeah. Um, But mum was always like very open with talking about these things, like you said, because she was a nurse and there was nothing really off limits. And she'd always be like, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. And she bought me this massive book. And I'm sure a lot of people will remember it, like Girls Stuff by Kaz Cook. Okay, and yeah. it's like this huge blue book just full of everything. And when she gave it to me, I remember feeling like super embarrassed, like, oh, my gosh, mom, like, I don't need a book. <laughs> Why would you buy this? Oh, cringe. Um, but then I'd actually secretly read it like at nighttime or on right. the weekends and things because it like actually did have a lot of good information in it. Oh, and mom. it was funny and relatable. And so I used to hide it under my bed. Um <laughs> Uh, but yeah so we we were very open but there was still that element of like awkwardness about it and I guess that's just to do with the lack of education around periods and pelvic health in general from an education perspective as well yes and the fact that we don't allow our daughters to be talking about periods and anything pelvic health outside the home so it's not exactly school and hopefully that's changing but it's um it's not something that you can even talk to your brother about in my generation particularly. And I think hopefully that's changing. And I was curious because you're much younger than me. I think in my mind as a mum, oh, I'm going to tell my daughter about everything. But then I'm pretty sure she's going to turn around in that pub- puberty age and go, oh, yeah, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> so I've got to try and find a way in. And I love that your mum's given me that idea just to buy the book. And even if she hides it under a bed, it could still help her. So that's cool. Thanks, easy mum. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pam. Shout out to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, where are things up to you? Uh, where are things up up to for you now in terms of you know both of those diagnoses? And you said you're able to live um, manage the symptoms better. So, where are, yeah, where are things up to for you now? Yeah, so I had a, another procedure in 2017 because. Um, one of the ways of managing adenomyosis is through an IUD. So I have two IUDs in currently um, on top of each other to just manage to, my adeno. Oh, sorry. It doesn't no, you're fine. Just to explain to people what an IUD is who are listening, perhaps who might be a bit younger and think, well, what's that? Save them Googling it and getting yeah. the wrong information. <laughs> what, what are they? What do they do? Yeah. So they're an intrauterine device. So you might know them as a Mirena or a Marina or if you're younger, you might even be, um, might even know about a Kylena. That's relatively new as well. So they're a progesterone releasing device that's placed into your uterus and they can stay in there anywhere between three to five years. And so it's just another um, option for uh, hormone management. So they, it's obviously not going to protect against STIs or anything like that. However, it's another um, contraceptive option there. So mine wasn't being used for contraceptive purposes, but mainly for um, hormone management with the conditions that I had. So I had two of those uh, in place and one of them had actually slipped down <laughs> into my cervix, oh, which wow. was fun. So yeah, in 2017, I just had um, a, a hysteroscopy. So just a quick procedure to remove those two and pop two new ones in and then I was managing really well yep. up until um about last year and oh. so that's when those pain that pain those symptoms started to really return and I was having that nausea feeling like I was going to be sick again I was having that breakthrough bleeding and things like that happening And so in January of this year, I went in for another laparoscopy and um, my adenomyosis had progressed slightly and they'd also found new endo on my um, pouch of Douglas, which is an area near your bowel, and then also some on the right side near my bladder. So um, got that removed. So they excised that, which just means they've cut that out. Um, that's yeah. the gold standard when we're dealing with endometriosis. So okay. they cut that out. And um, since then I have been, you know, back to my great quality of life again, managing my symptoms as best as I can. Obviously fatigue is still um, mm-hmm. a big one for me, but um, I'm getting better at being kinder to myself and not piling 
things on top and then beating myself up if I don't get all of them yeah. done. So yeah, yeah, trying to give myself that grace and kindness. Yeah. And it's hard because if it was something you could see, say like if it was a pain in your wrist and you were wearing a guard, you wouldn't use it because you have to rest it and you wouldn't feel bad about it. But because it's internal and invisible, I think sometimes the perception is in the public that we just have to push on. And I do think that endometriosis, thankfully, is now being seen and talked about for what it really is, that it's not just women whinging about bad periods or heavy periods, that it's actually a medical condition that needs medical attention. Um, however, which way you do that, some people do it with Western medicine and a mixture of Eastern medicine. And did you, I guess it'd be interesting to find out, do you kind of have a mixture of both? I know a friend who does um, acupuncture to help. Do, do you do anything like that as well? Yeah. So the thing with endo and adeno is surgery is one part of it, but you have to have like your A team, your cheerleaders who are helping you to manage your conditions because you know, one thing isn't going to help alone and it's super holistic and Mm -hmm. multidisciplinary care that's required. So I see an osteopath quite regularly. Um, shout out to Dr. Bron. Awesome. Um, she's I love amazing. That. Yeah, do, and, please do. <laughs> yeah, and so she's wonderful. So I found um, really good at releasing that pelvic space because there's adhesions and things that can um, inhibit organ functions and things like that. So working with that, um, seeing a pelvic physiotherapist as well, because a lot of people can end up suffering from vaginismus um, secondary to these conditions. So a pelvic physio had just been a lifesaver for me as well. Um, Additionally, I've seen a nutritionist and a naturopath, um, but I just want to preface this with like, I haven't seen all of these people all at the one time yeah, sure. um, because that's very journey. expensive. Um, yes. Yeah. So I sort of dip in and dip out for what's needed at what time, but yeah. And then also uh, acupuncture has been really beneficial as well for me, but everything is different for everyone. So yeah. finding sort of who's in your team, who works best for you and finding those people that are going to cheer you on and are there for you. And, you know, that includes those family and friends as well. Yeah. And I guess that through this process, you've had to educate others about what you've, what you've been through and what you do go through. And I'd love to talk about that now, because I'm assuming that your personal experiences and that lived experience led you to creating your own podcast, right? Which is where I found you because it's amazing. (laughs) So um, I love the name, Let's Talk Period. So obviously, um, it, oh, you explain it. Where did the name come from? Because I don't, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like a double entendre, I guess. Like yes. let's talk period and let's talk about periods. Let's talk about pelvic health. Let's talk sexual health. Yes. Let's talk reproductive health. All of those taboo topics that nobody wants to talk about. Let's talk about them. Yeah, great. So that's where the name sort of came from. And yeah, it's just really came from a place of when I was diagnosed initially, I just felt super alone. Mm. There was hardly any information out there, especially about adenomyosis. Yeah. You couldn't trust that the information was reputable. You were reading blogs and things like that, but that's just people's lived experiences, which are great. Um, But wanting to have that reputable information that you know is backed by um, peer-reviewed journal articles and And actual yeah proper research has gone into them. So that sort of was a real sticking point for me, having a place where you can go to for information that you can actually rely on Mm. and yeah even if like you could make if I could make one person's journey that a little bit less difficult that would just you know make me so happy because I just know how I felt when I was first diagnosed and if I could make that easier for someone else brilliant I love that and then having those open conversations where nothing's off limits it really lets people um, dive deep into these conversations and confession I never even heard of your second condition until 10 minutes ago and I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm in this women's pelvic health space and I'm trying to learn everything because I go and learn a lot about my anatomy but I have learned by talking to amazing women like you I really don't know anything about my own body (laughs) 
It's so scary. Yeah, I think it's like the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Yes. And yeah, you just have to keep trying to find out as much as you can. But yeah, it's through these conversations that we do get to know even more. And even if you don't think that information is relevant to you, it sort of just sits in the back of your mind and then you can use it later on down the track and you go, oh, I've heard of that before and just all adds to your awareness and understanding. Yeah, and it's true. You can't take everything in. Our bodies are super complex and phenomenal. So you can't know everything and how it works unless you're in biology or something like that. But when you, like you said, when you do need to find out about it, you can always come back and check in. So tell us on your podcast, who have been some of your guests and more so the topics that you talk about? Yeah, so the that's like my favorite part, just the people I get to speak <laughs> with and the amazing things that they're doing. So um, just a few, like we've had Rochelle Courtney from Share the Dignity on there talking about like period I'm, poverty. I feel like I'm trying to channel her today. This pink dress, <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Pink's her color, so yeah. <laughs> like her color. And I <laughs> but, love yeah, that. like Rochelle from Share the Dignity and Christy Chong, the CEO of Modi Body, talking about um, eco-friendly period period products, period yeah. underwear, and then period poverty with her as well. Um, we've had the um, amazing Chantelle Otten. If you haven't heard of her, she's a psychosexologist. So she deals a lot in the vaginismus space and pelvic pain space. So she works really closely with pelvic physiotherapists. So we had um, Dora Pandaloglu on the pod as well, who is an incredible Melbourne-based pelvic physio. And then more recently, we had Ash Mason, who is the developer, um, the program developer of the Kick Bump app. So, um, or not the Bump app because it's within the Kick app, but she was the <laughs> curriculum director for Kick Bump. So she's um, a women's health physio. So lots of amazing evidence-based professionals and then also personal stories as well. So yep. um, I've had Bridget Husswaite from Triple J who runs the Instagram account Endogram and then also Georgia Stewart from the Endo Journal. So yep. just so many amazing people sharing their stories and lived experiences as well as balancing it with those professionals who have uh, evidence-based information and really yeah, helpful right. tips as well. That's so good. And I think that balance is what's needed because when you're starting out on a journey, you do go to Google and it tells you the worst things in the world. Um, <clears throat> but then sometimes then when you go to your doctor, I know even for pro women with prolapse, they're often quite dismissed. Oh, it's not so bad. You'll be fine. Just go and do some Kegels or whatever. And it's like you only going through a Facebook group, from total strangers, who end up becoming your friends that you actually then have the knowledge to go back and say, Hey, but can I have this test? And it gives you that empowerment. I mean, I know that word is so overused in women's health at the moment, <laughs> empowerment, <laughs> but it really does. It just gives you that now to say, Hey, can I have that scan? And nine times out of 10, they say, okay, tell me why. All right, sure. Let's do it. And then like you, you end up being, looked after in a way that you need to be I was going to say right but it doesn't who cares if you're right you just want the support <laughs> exactly it's yeah having to advocate for yourself but then knowing what to advocate for exactly. um so yeah having to reach to those Facebook groups is tricky because you are just trusting strangers on the internet but mm -hmm. Yeah, having those people to go to in a sort of non-formal way because podcasts are a little bit more accessible and yeah. no one knows what you're listening to if you're listening to it through <laughs> your earphones. So yeah. it does make it that little bit more intimate and you can relax a little bit. Yeah, I hope so. And I just actually, if you don't mind, I do want to jump back into vaginisms because I only really uh, was aware of them when someone reached out to me very privately. We have a very private space um, where people can feel comfortable to talk about these things and not be identified. But she um, said that they happened to her and I didn't even know what they were. So I went straight to Google, what are these? And went, oh my gosh, this is horrific. And I don't know, maybe um, you could explain it because you've spoken to women about it in that space. What are they? And what? Yeah. You know, yeah, so there's two types of vaginismus. So there's primary and secondary. I'm obviously not an expert, but um, it's very linked with the pelvic floor. And so uh, 
I always get it confused whether it's the primary or the secondary one because they are very linked but okay. uh, it can either be a mental thing that occurs and you seize up and all of those pelvic muscles tighten and any object entering that vaginal canal just it's imminently painful so that could be like a dilator it could be a wand it could be a tampon it could be a penis it could be a vibrator anything like that or it could be you know any of those things so anything inserting even if you're doing um, an examination to check for strings for IUDs and things like that um, painful and then there's also the psychological side of things as well where it's the just a fear or an anxiety around it which automatically seizes that up and creates that pain and that that clenching sensation and yeah yeah, so it's something that it is really good to work with both a sexologist and a pelvic physio if you are experiencing vaginismus because um, the sexologist side of things they can really work with those anxieties and talk through those um, fear processes and help you to work through those triggers and yeah. then the pelvic physio can actually yeah. assist with that internal work and relaxing those pelvic floor muscles because if you have um, prolapse or any conditions like endo or adeno as well all of those pelvic muscles are also intertwined and they get really tight or they can become quite loose and so working with the physio can assist with strengthening or relaxing that pelvic floor. I spoke to a um, a girl a few weeks, a a lady a few weeks ago about, she's saying the misconception is that your pelvic floor has to be super tight. So you have to keep working really, really hard. She said, actually, you need also need to know how to stretch and relax it. It, It's a muscle that is like a, um, what are they, a consultina. They they want to open and close. And that's what we have to do, which, I think when you're watching Instagram and women are just get your pelvic floor super rock hard so you can do a marathon or whatever it's yeah it's not quite correct so that balance is good would you consider Izzy um things like that and pelvic health to be a disability I don't identify as disabled myself however it can be very it can have huge impacts that it can be disabling Mm -hmm. um and it depends on the degree like I know people Mm. who do have that bladder incontinence and that fecal incontinence and that's so disabling in itself Mm. um yeah like that's horrific and that's disabling and I know it's having that invisible illness again and Mm. I've been in cases where I have needed to use the disabled toilets even though I don't identify as disabled but Yep. If I hold my bladder in any longer, I know that I'm going to end in a flare in about, you know, half an hour. And okay. then I come out of the disabled toilet and I get these really yeah. cranky looks from people. Mm. And I think people, you know, they need to be a little bit more kind. No one knows mm. what you're going through. Um, yeah. So especially with that invisible illness side of things, it can be incredibly disabling through bladder incontinence fecal incontinence and that side of things yeah and I think that you're right it just obviously always depends on the person and how it affects you because I know that you said earlier that you've had to call in sick from work so it stops you from doing your and I'm putting in parentheses here normal daily activities like being able to go to school and go to work and be able to be at school in your uniform without having to go home and get changed so it can be debilitating and I don't think um I never wanted people to have to feel like they have to have a label or not. It's just Mm. interesting to just open that conversation because uh, we've done polls within our groups and it usually divides people. And I don't want the division. I want it to be more like if you feel that your injury, your invisible injury is debilitating enough that it disables you from carrying on your normal daily activity, like going to work or feeding or showering or even just carrying your children, for goodness sake, Mm -hmm. then if that's for you, then awesome. And if like yourself, if you don't identify as that, then that's totally fine too. I just don't want it to be this, I hate the verses. The verses are me. Yeah, exactly. It's super fluid. And, Mm. you know, some days you could be having an amazing day and you're like, wow, this isn't even impacting me at all. Other days, you know, you could be, laying on the couch and you can't pick up your baby or anything like that and 
you're like, wow, this is really disabling today. So kind of, yeah, exactly. Not sticking with that label, just being really fluid and then being kind to the people who do identify as disabled and they actually take that on. Um, yeah, I see a lot of debate about it back and forth online. Yeah, and I just yeah. think, you know, everyone do what works best for them. You know, you do you. Yeah, I love that. Stay in your own lane. I love that, you know, I've had that analogy for a little while, just keep in your own lane and forget about what everyone else is doing. I think more so um, the reason why I'm opening these conversations, Izzy, is because in the hope that if somebody does identify as being disabled by their condition, that they can access the support needed to be the best they can be. So they need to access funds to go to the women's health physio. That's It's quite expensive. It's not a cheap service and I'm not saying it should be. But if you need to go three times a week, like I did in the beginning, you need to be able to afford it. If you need to get the seventh try of a pessary because the, the, the six previous haven't worked and it's $250 per appointment or whatever, I just want people to have access to funds to, to get that. And it's a shame that we even have to go down that path of saying, yes, I identify as having a disability and now I want to access that support. I just would love the support to be there anyway, regardless. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, at the same time, I don't want the uh, current community of people with disabilities feeling like it's a bad thing to, to say that you have a disability or take in the piss. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's oh, very, I completely very understand where you're coming from. Yeah. There's so many hoops to jump through as it is, but then... Yes yeah accessing that funding is just a whole nother barrier and if you do have a chronic condition um, you can see your GP for that chronic condition care plan however that entitles you to five visits Mm. a year Mm -hmm. Uh, and if we are seeing a pelvic physio three times a week that would be three visits and then you've got two visits the following week and then you're paying full price for the rest of those visits so yeah um yeah, I completely agree. So if that is a pathway that you do need to look down to access funding, then, you know, unfortunately that is something like I just wish there was more out there for people so who do right. have those chronic conditions. I mean, currently, I, even if if someone does identify with a disability, um, our health system doesn't support women with pelvic health, regardless. It doesn't matter. if you. And this is the way I have tried to give the analogy to some people that, If someone has a a limb amputated, it's very clear. It's very, you know, similar black and white. But if someone has their pelvic floor amputated off their bone, like in my example, if you've got an avulsion with your Mm -hmm. muscle and you cannot get it reattached, then you can't see it. So therefore it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? And, and, and there is no current support. We've tried that avenue ourselves. And I know many women that have tried to contact the NDIS and say, look, this happened to me during childbirth. I need support. And often it's met with just go and do Kegels, which is horrific. <laughs> yeah, no amount of Kegels is going to fix that. And I think, yeah, the notion of what is a disability really needs to evolve to where we are at in 2021 and to include more invisible disabilities because... Yeah, there's so many versions of what a disabled person looks like. Um, not yeah. just that, you know, traditional person in the wheelchair on the toilet signs that we have. So right. yeah, and the completely car agree. Well. Yeah. Like you, I know um, we've just created a short film on invisible disability for the car park sticker incident in particular, like, like you with the bathroom, when you come out, you got judged really badly. Um I've been in that situation where I've had to use the car space in, you know, in the late afternoon and I've had people actually come up to me and say, you know, you don't look disabled. What are you doing parking here and kind of accosting me? Then you've got to try and justify yourself. And then they don't want to listen anyway. Like it's really hard to make water more wet. If someone has their mind up, their their mind made up Mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be there. It's no point even trying to convince them otherwise because they don't care that, type of idiots that say stuff like that 
they don't <laughs> you can't convince them so oh they're just looking for an argument honestly so yeah you can't appease them with no matter what you say even if you've yeah. got the proof to justify and you shouldn't have to justify yourself to strangers anyway yeah that's right but you do feel like you need to I almost want to have in the boot of my car just boxes of those t-shirts you know like kind is cool and be kind just so like here have that <laughs> and them out left right and center <laughs> just shut up and have that be on your way. It would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, so, Definitely. Izzy, what would be your big dream goal for Let's Talk Period podcast? Uh, I would just love to continue having those important conversations, opening up those conversations for people so everyone feels like they are included in that space and they can access these conversations and there's nothing to be ashamed of there's no taboos or stigmas or anything like that and just being able to help as many people as possible through the pod um and then you know COVID permitting I would absolutely love to do some live events to get the let's talk period podcast community together um, it's such a beautiful space online, but I know that it would just, you know, that energy would just be electric if we could all come together. That would just be absolutely amazing. And then I don't know, the sky is the limit. Who knows, really? Yeah. Um, I never even thought that I'd even have a podcast. Looking back to 14-year-old me, I think she'd just be absolutely blown away. Um yeah, so who knows? Watch this space. I love that. That is so good. And I love that sky's the limit because who knows what can happen once we do come out of lockdown. I, I feel like there's a few key people in the community who are having these conversations that would be an absolute powerhouse as a panel. And so we'll put it out there, like plant the seeds, let them grow. And then women, we can all come together and do like Make a, it happen. a road show. <laughs> That would be amazing. Yeah, and I feel like you're probably similar in the way that by helping others, it fills your bucket for you. And I know that, you know, that's good too. That's amazing that you can do something that you love and you can do while at the same time helping others. So Completely let's talk agree. about how we can make this space better for our girls. And that by, I mean, you know, my daughter's generation who are five and the, the girls coming up and my niece. So why do you think or do you think that we are still having trouble sharing information about pelvic health? I think it comes back to that thing where it is that taboo and there's that shame around not being able to speak about periods, issues with periods outside of the house. It's that you know, this is something we speak about in private. This isn't a mm -hmm. conversation for everybody still and um with a primary teacher background and now a health background as well um you know I can say from personal experience that we're still segregating the girls and the boys when it comes to that period chat that puberty okay. chat um so we're still setting people up for that space that you know this is something we only speak about with people who identify as female um and mm. then it sets that notion up of this is something that we're shameful of from the beginning and we don't know what the boys are talking about in their chat. The boys don't know what they're, we're talking about in our girl chat. Okay. Um, and also it's also very exclusive of the, you know, LGBTQIA community who, you know, they might identify yeah. as a female and they're over in the boys chat and they're feeling really, left out so I think it all still starts from that so we're still having trouble because we've got that traditional view still um mm -hmm. we're still not having those conversations there's you know we're still not using correct language uh for right. our body parts so calling yeah. them what they are you know, know this is your vagina this is your vulva this is a penis not using terms like doodle and things like that actually you know talking about our anatomy correctly yeah and hopefully I think that's that's changing a little bit I know even in my careers teaching child protection was the only place we talked about it with young ones because the, they it's up to the parents to decide when to call whatever but I don't remember us really ever saying vulva we called the whole encompassing women's public health the vagina and to know that that's incorrect now is like wow to change the curriculum 
it's really hard. So it is up to us and uh, as the parents to say, because I mean, you think about it, my son has a penis and a scrotum. We don't just call all of it penis because it's easier. It's my daughter's got a vagina and a vulva, but yet we all just say one word because it's easier. I don't know. It's, exactly. And that bias, but, yeah. Yeah, and I can relate with the not knowing it was called a vulva for a long time as well. Like I was in uni when I realized and you know I feel like that's a bit late but that's just the way it was like that was what it was I just thought the whole area was your vagina I had no idea so definitely having that language Mm. to use and you know you're a former teacher so you get this as well but you know knowledge is power education is power so having that knowledge to make those informed choices just really opens everything up I'll let you in on a little secret. Most women don't know the difference between vagina and vulva, but when questioned about it, because remember that group episode with Gwyneth Paltrow and she didn't know and then she got ridiculed. You don't even know what the difference is. But And everyone had a little giggle like, oh, that's funny. Oh, shit, are they different? Like that, that's yeah, I better Google that quickly. And go, yeah. Yeah, for, for most <laughs> women. And, um, so there's not, and even the shame around not knowing that but no one's ever told you that you don't have to feel embarrassed that you didn't know the difference because no one's ever said, Hey, did you know that's different? And it should be called different. I've seen some debates on Facebook groups about it. Like, Oh, get over yourself. It's just a vagina. You know, it's what we've always called it. Stop being so pedantic, but I'm like, well, it's incorrect. You don't say, you know, that this thing is actually your wrist. It's not, it's just not. (laughs) exactly call it for what it is yeah and the conditions are different so the conditions for pelvic organ prolapse are in your vaginal canal all the other things with your labia and your vulva and different types of conditions relate to that so it's yeah it's it's a funny one but you know um so what do you think are some like Pam said and well Pam put the book in there for you (laughs) lovers what would be some of the ways we could start those conversations I mean you were a teenager not too long ago do you think there was any way that could have been helpful for your mum to talk to you about it yeah like she always used like correct language so I'll just like flag that again but Mm -hmm. she didn't call it vulva either she just said for she's just said vagina as well but using that correct language calling it calling it a vagina when we're talking about that vaginal canal talking about the vulva in general and then using the word period when it does come to our menstrual cycle saying I'm on my period not using code words and things like that Mm -hmm. I know when I was a teenager I always used to call it my red car to my friends and we'd all have a giggle um (laughs) but actually calling it what it is um and then Yeah. yeah like with um when we're actually getting ready for our periods as a teenager um you know, involving your teenager in the process. So Mm -hmm. I just remember um, mum handing me a pack of pads and saying, look, just keep these in your bag. You might get your period when you're at school, have a spare pair of undies in there uh, and you'll be good to go. And like that was done with the most pure and best intentions, of course, but involving them in the process and talking about the different options and what that actually means. I think a lot of us can remember the tampon demonstration of like just being chucked into a bowl of water and watching how big it expands and then being freaked out that that has to go up inside you so um, yeah talking about all the different options so period underwear as like a really good one Mm, especially um, when we're younger and you might not want to use tampons and things like that or culturally you can't or if you are experiencing vaginismus, you can't. So working to develop like a little period kit together and having one uh, ready for your school bag and having one ready for sleepovers. Because I remember I got my period once at a sleepover and oh my gosh, I was not prepared at all. And I stayed on the couch for as late as possible until I had to get up because I didn't have anything with me. And then that embarrassment about having to ask for a pad. So even trying to promote those conversations in your friendship groups as a teenager as well yeah great and it's something um having a kit ready but this is the this is the question right some girls get their periods from 11 10 11 12 whereas I was I think I was maybe 
13. So I was really late according to the, you know, the books. And so it's hard to know when do you start talking to your daughter because mm. of that judgment when if your daughter goes to school at 10 or 11 and starts talking to her friends about it and those parents are not ready, those, those mums and dads are not quite ready for those conversations. They're like, why are they talking to you about periods? You know too much and it's, it starts the ball rolling. I think as parents we need to get over that. I know that I've even had people look at me like, do you really say vulva to your daughter? Yeah, I do. And that's cool. Mm. If it's yeah, not and, dad, you know, they alone. know too much too early. Like there's nothing that breeds that notion of shame again. Like there's nothing yeah. wrong with knowing about that. I know like I don't have children yet, but I have friends who have young children and they are about three or four and they know like when because you know I guess going to the bathroom by yourself is a thing of the past when you've got kids and (laughs) if you are on your period and you're popping a pad on they're actually saying well I'm putting a pad on because I'm on my period so bringing up I love from you know three four that this is something that you do and that's nothing to hide or be ashamed of or anything so I guess there's no time that's too early or you know they're knowing about this too young that it's and it's it's normalized and it's um you know destigmatized or desensitized like so that yes. it's not a secret that by the time they're they're young boys like oh what is that they they don't have to be inquisitive because they already know and it's quite normal just like everything else right exactly mm. and, and just it's funny I just go back because I I wrote a script for the final episode of this season. And it just kind of hit me all at once. I realized that perhaps our mums did just give us the pad and say, here you go, because that's what they were given. And then their mums did the same to them with, you know, cloth rags or whatever, because they probably actually didn't understand it themselves, to be fair. Exactly. That's it. And you just... It's sort of the saying, when you know better, you do better. And mm-hmm. would you like a better experience for your daughter or the next generation and use your knowledge to make it better for them, not just because this is what we've always done. Mm-hmm. And I think challenging that notion and, you know, questioning critically, why am I doing this? And yeah. can I make this experience better for someone else? And I think it just comes back to being selfless and trying to, do something to make the next generation better it's and so easier. yeah so they don't have to also do that awkward thing with their daughters mm-hmm. and keep that you know pers- that not perspective but that p- practice from occurring mm-hmm. again and again but you know educating those future generations so it is better we do it with everything else for goodness sake we do it, we've done it with this no smoking campaign we've done it with um you know budgeting and you've got to save money better like we've done it for all of those things so let's just hope that well, I'm working really hard to make sure I can do that with my daughter it'd be funny to tune in in 10 years time when she's a teenager and she's like oh, fuck her off <laughs> she's like geez Steph oh <laughs> <laughs> I'll just make a listen to the podcast I'll dig it out of the fire <laughs> out of yeah. the treasure chest. <laughs> so do you think um you know in your in this obviously involves your own journey do you think our current health system here in Australia is supporting women's pelvic health enough? Um, no. Uh, okay, I to think be honest, I'm, I, you know, but let's yeah. start these conversations, right? Yeah, like definitely not. I know that the government has, you know, recently committed a lot more to endometriosis funding specifically. That's only one piece of the pie, though. We've got so many other conditions mm. and birth trauma is one of them especially that have like no funding attached to them Mm. and so many areas of women's health are exactly the same and so if you aren't privileged enough to access private health insurance you're facing lengthy delays with subadequate care um, often and very brief appointments and you're in and out very quickly so then on the other side, if you are fortunate enough to have uh, private health, it is very expensive. So that's a cost. And then trying to juggle all of those things that I was speaking of earlier 
I would love to go and use all of those therapies at the same yeah. time to manage my condition. That would be amazing, but sure. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, yeah. That's too expensive. But yeah, so then we often have people foregoing treatment and waiting until things could be even worse for them because they cannot afford that care. And so, you know, um, I was speaking with one of my really good friends the other day that I have probably spent like upwards of $50,000 on managing my health since, you know, since I was diagnosed or just before trying to go to all those appointments, trying to find out what was wrong. And like $50,000 might seem like hyperbolic and like it's a lot of money. And like, there's no way she could have spent that, but you know, it all adds up. And Mm -hmm. I think we have a long way to go in that healthcare system to be supporting women's health and their needs much more like supporting their needs better. Yeah. The, the, as the prevention better than the cure saying, yeah, exactly. Being proactive instead of reactive. You love that. And I think people don't really realize that in that equation, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's probably more than 50,000, but that's just what you've been able to remember. When I had to go back and um, do some additions for what what my uh, traumatic birth and the costs for the ongoing therapies and stuff like that, once we hit over $200,000, like, whoa, what else do you do? Because people forget that it's not just the $250 appointments, it's getting there, it's finding the babysitter to get there. Or, or the level of support, but it's also it's the parking the, fees. Yeah, the things you need to buy after. But it's also the loss of income. If you can no longer do your career like me in teaching any longer because standing and walking is really painful, then my potential earnings is ridiculous, like reduced to basically zero. And you have to factor that in as part of the costs of what happened to you or, or your condition. People don't realize that. No, because had you oh, exactly, had yeah. yeah, people don't think of that. And I've, um, when I was teaching full time, I would always schedule my surgery in my holidays, so yeah. I didn't have to take annual leave or time off work because I couldn't afford to not be working. So right. I would use my yeah. whole two week holiday planning from bed and yeah. recovering post lap because I needed to use that time instead of trying to you know relax after a busy term so yeah that loss of income is astronomical and you know that's not even factored into what I've spent and that's exactly it all that I can remember but there's so many other things like parking yeah and and the emotional expense as well because it is very draining and yeah it is yeah there's a lot of different factors which is probably why we can guess, right? We're allowed to guess on our show. We can probably guess why our government doesn't even know where to start. It's so multifaceted and you need to do mental health and physical health and all of it together probably is going to add up to a shitload of money that we don't have. And we especially don't have it right now because of COVID and lockdown and supporting others. So what do women do? Carry on. Just we just have to try and do the best we can. And I think a lot of women are doing that now. But I would love to see some, maybe even some private enterprise or social enterprise coming into this space and saying, hey, look, we know that you can't do this. We could offer you this level of support, you know. And I think it is it's going to take us women to be able to push forward with that type of thing. And I think that's, you know, that's the next mm-hmm. big thing on my list. <laughs> Yeah, again, it comes back to having to advocate for yourself. No one's going to come and hand it to you, unfortunately. Like everyone wishes that would happen. But, yeah, it's, again, having to go out, advocate for yourself, advocate for your community and what they need for better care. And, unfortunately, we are in that too hard basket right now. Yeah, I think so. And, look, it's the same for all communities. It's, for, you know, parents who have children with disabilities or, you know, the autism spectrum, they all at some point have had to advocate for themselves that their children are not badly behaved, that there is a real condition and they need real support and they've come long, 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 long away thanks to, you know, Julia Gillard's time with the NDIS. I mean, that's certainly not even close to perfect, but it's better than what they had, which was nothing. So exactly. um, I don't want to go down that politics rabbit hole though, because it's too, <laughs> it's too irky. Um, 
do you think there are some things that women listening today can do for themselves right now to help with their own pelvic health care? Yeah, of course. Uh, Number one, I'm going to flag our kindness tease again. Be kind to yourself, firstly. Just like actually thank yourself for all that you're currently doing because you're actually doing the best that you can. And we are our own harshest critics and we're always so down on ourselves. So actually just giving yourself a moment and thinking, wow, I'm actually doing a really good job and I'm trying my best with what I have. So just that, you can do that for yourself today. And then if you can, I'm going to advocate for our pelvic physiotherapists because they do so much important work. If you can go and just get an assessment um, to see what's going on internally uh, because, it, you know, knowledge is power. Doing those Kegels just because someone on Instagram told you to do them uh, can be really damaging. And if you don't have that info around why I'm doing those Kegels and do I actually need to be doing them or should I be working on opening up my pelvic floor, yeah. uh, that's something really important. And you might only need one or two sessions with a physio and they might say, no, you're actually really good. Just keep doing what you're doing. Or it might take that little bit longer. But having that like knowledge base and starting from there can really help that pelvic health. And then if you do have concerns, chat with your GP, don't, don't put up with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yes. You're not getting the answer that you want. Go and see someone else. Right. It's Mm -hmm. like similarly with pelvic health. I went to a pelvic health sorry a pelvic floor physio that was linked to the place where I gave birth who told me I was doing amazing and you're improving and I walked away thinking I don't I feel worse yeah I don't feel amazing I don't feel like I'm doing anything I can't actually feel like when she's like oh yeah you've got a really good lift and like a really nice cheer squad I walked out going oh am I I just must be so numb I can't feel it okay but I wasn't improving. There was never going to be an improvement when a muscle's torn away from the bone. You can't strengthen that. It's flapping in the breeze. So that's what I mean. If you, if you, if your body's telling you something different to your care provider, find someone else. Exactly. And walk with your feet. Like you, you are generally, you're paying for that person. If you're Mm -hmm. accessing public health, it can be a different scenario, but prior uh, pelvic physios are generally not, attached or they can be but most of the time you are seeing them privately so finding that person who actually is working with you has that same goal of care and they aren't just telling you yeah you're doing really well when you might not be so (laughs) your gut really does have you've got this amazing ability like it tells you and you can just sense when something's off just following that and not pushing that down Mm. um and not just with pelvic physios but any any person that you are seeing in that health space Mm. following that intuition and that feeling you have like is this the right thing if you're disagreeing with what they're wanting for you um going and seeing someone else getting a second opinion and if they're like actually no that is the best practice that's what we're doing that's fine then you're like okay great I'm glad I'm on the same page you know it's your body it's your health um and advocating for yourself is you know no one else is going to advocate for you generally so having to do that work is tiring but important yeah, if you if you want a particular outcome or if you want to, you know, if you want a result or something like that, then yeah, you have to. I remember seeing about four different surgeons or four different specialists to, to see if I could have another baby living with prolapse. Um, and three, and, and I got two saying, yes, you can, yes, you can. I'm like, but are they sure? Like I was so nervous. And so I did use a mixture of public and private. And then the third one said, yes, you can. But you have to think about the long-term effects of having two young children. How are you going to cope physically? I was like, okay, so he was a no. And then I went to the last one and said, yes, you can. So three said yes and one said no. That gave me enough information to make a proper informed decision where I would live with the consequences, both positive and negative, with the result. That's it. Exactly. And then having that information to make that informed decision and feeling comfortable in it yes. is so important. Yes. And so I know it, it did 
took a lot of time and it cost a fair bit of money but in the end I don't regret it and I think I couldn't have done anything more than what I already did so when people always say oh but you went on to have a second baby after birth trauma it mustn't have been that bad I'm like hey it was a process, my friend. It was so hard. It involved, you know, seeing a psychologist as well. Like it wasn't just a, yeah, sure, let's go for it. It was such a thought out thing. So, um, yeah, but, you know, that's that judgment thing, you know. <laughs> Again, know it Aussies comes back to not knowing what's going on with people's yeah. lives and stopping for a second, reflecting and going, actually, this isn't my business. Um they're doing the best they can. They're trying to find out what's best for them. Yeah. Or I'm curious, could you share it with me? Like there's always a nicer yeah. way in. There's always exactly. A nicer way in, you know, but um, so for our listeners today who would like to find out more about your podcast, where can they find you? Yes, you can find me in a few places. So um, if you're an Instagram user, I love a bit of Instagram. So you can find us yes. at Let's Talk Period AU. Yes. And then if you want to find the podcast, uh, we're on most podcast apps, but Apple and Spotify yep. are my faves. So yeah, they're the go-to. So if you just search Let's Talk Period, you can find um, the podcast on there or we do have the website as well let's talk period.com.au bravo we will certainly put those links in the show notes as well people can just jump on and continue those amazing conversations I think you have really taught us we've well, certainly taught me a lot today and you're, I'm sure you've taught everyone something and, and continuing those conversations on your podcast thanks for chatting with us today Isabel I've really appreciated it no, thank you so much for having me, Steph. It has been such a pleasure. Thanks. Awesome. Well, watch this space, ladies and gentlemen, because I think this um, roadshow in maybe 2023, 2022, who knows? Who it's knows? Coming. <laughs> coming. It'll be there. We're doing it. Awesome. Thank you.